with you quick all right this morning we're going to observe the lord's supper and many times as we observe the lord's supper i give you a time of invitation before the lord's supper that invitation is going to be now all right you have a portion of time left in this service before we take the lord's supper the lord's supper is going to come in the middle of the message i'm going to focus on two things this morning the body and baptism And halfway in, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper together. And you're not going to have an invitation time prior to the Lord's Supper. You and I understand that we should not take of this Lord's Supper if we have unrepentant hearts towards God or unrepentant hearts towards another individual. And so I want to encourage you. I want you to take of the Lord's Supper. So maybe... When we have a time of prayer, maybe you need to come and kneel down at this altar and take care of business here. Maybe you need to step back into that prayer room. There's a telephone in that prayer room right there. I know most of you carry a telephone, but there's a telephone in that prayer room there. You need to pick that phone up and call somebody and ask for their forgiveness. So this morning, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. We're going to talk about the importance of our worship through the Lord's Supper, as well as through baptism. We're going to have baptism next week. Couldn't get them all on both, both on one week. But next week we're going to celebrate baptism. We have a young lady who accepted Christ in the middle school Bible study that we do on Tuesdays. They don't go to church anywhere. And uh, she's, her mom has agreed to allow her to come here uh, for baptism. And uh, we're grateful for that. And we're going to pray that God will open up more doors for them to be members here and all. But they don't go to church anywhere. But they'll be here with us next week uh, to allow her to be baptized, and we praise God for that. But this morning, I want to encourage you. I want you to take of the Lord's Supper. But if you need to take care of any kind of unrepentant heart before that Lord's Supper, then I want to encourage you to do that. During this welcome, slip out, go down to one of those classrooms, go back into that prayer room, make a phone call if you need to make a phone call. If that's not something you need to do, if you need to come bow down here at this altar, if you need to go, just be alone with God for a few moments. If that needs to be done while we're singing, that's fine. But I want us to understand, I want us to come to this Lord's Supper ready to receive what God would have to give us. And So I'm glad that you've chosen to be here this morning. I know that was kind of heavy right off, right off the start, but I do pray that this morning we will worship Him as we need to through the ordinances of baptism, excuse me, 
We're not going to do baptism, but as we talk about baptism, but also as we actually partake of the Lord's Supper. So if you're visiting with us, we are glad that you've chosen to visit with us. And then um, uh, let's let's uh, greet one another, and then we'll get back to worship.
continue to worship you here in this place. We know that we have a great privilege that comes before us. This privilege is to be able to be one, to be unified, to walk together. And so God, this morning I pray that you will give to us, indeed, unity, harmony, to togetherness. That as a family, as we come to this table, that we would come for the very purpose of remembering the work that was done on the cross. Lord, it is likely that there are those with us this morning who are not Christians. For the most part, they are not Christians because they've not come to that point of surrendering to you. Maybe for some, there is confusion. For others, the enemy has put blinders over their eyes and they do not really see the need to become a Christian. Lord, maybe there are some who, God, they have refused to surrender to you. They're walking in rebellion. They love the sins of this world and the things of this world more than you. And they're unwilling to give up some of the things that you will call them to give up after they accept you as Lord and Savior. So I pray this morning that, Lord, you will begin to move our hearts towards you today. Lord, I pray for those who are confused, that, God, you will bring clarity. Father, I pray for those whose eyes have been blinded and they do not see their need of the forgiveness of sins. And Lord, I pray that you would make it clear to them that they are a sinner in desperate need of the forgiveness of their sins. And Lord, I pray for those this morning whose hearts are hard toward you and rebellious toward you. God, I pray that they would know this morning that they can come to you just as they are. They can come to you and that God, upon their surrender to you, you will begin to change those things in their life that need to change. And it will not be a great burden, but it will turn out to be a great blessing for them. So God, will you show them the truth of your gospel today, the good news of Jesus Christ today? God, this morning we recognize that second. Corinthians 5.17 says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. For the old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And Lord, I pray for some who are holding on to some of the sins of their past. They have refused to forgive themselves. Even though, God, you have forgiven them, they continue to refuse 
to forgive themselves. And so I pray that this morning, God, that they would indeed come to understand your total and complete forgiveness that they themselves might forgive themselves. God, also pray for those this morning who have a bitter heart towards another person. Lord, I pray that this morning that there would be confession of that. And Lord, this morning they would confess that to you. Lord, this morning they would take care of confessing that to whoever that individual is that they have a bitter heart towards. And God, I pray that this morning they would seek forgiveness. They would repent. And they would walk with you. They would partake of the Lord's Supper with a clean heart. And so God, this morning, however you need to work in our lives, God, I pray that we would allow you to do so. Lord, we surrender to you. We surrender our all to you. And so God, lead us to worship you this morning. God, we give thanks for Galen being home. God, we are grateful for the work that you have done. And we look forward to the new work that is ahead for us. And Lord, I pray that our missionaries in Mali. I pray, Father, for our missionaries in Zambia, in Indonesia, in Thailand in Brazil, in Venezuela, in India. That God, wherever our missionaries are, these are places in which we know individuals, but wherever, Lord, there are many places where there are missionaries serving and we do not know their names. And So, Lord, for these that we know their names, for these that we do not, we want to intercede for them. We want to lift them up before you and ask you, Lord, do a great work in their lives. Do a great work in their lives personally and do a great work in their lives that, Lord, they would get to see a great harvest to come for all of the labor in which they are giving. Lord, I pray for some of those missionaries who, Lord, maybe for some they're struggling with some sin issues. God, would you purify them? God, maybe they need some accountability. God, would you provide that accountability for them? God, we pray for the Edwards in Wyoming and the many others throughout North America that are serving so faithfully. As we draw near to Easter, we are reminded of this month of prayer that we will spend in remembering all of those who serve throughout North America. God, what a privilege we have what an obligation a responsibility that we share and so God we are grateful for the opportunity God this morning we do pray for our military we pray for those serving in harm's way we pray for those Lord who are separated from family members we know that there is much going on in the world today There are things that concern us. There are places where we are involved and there are places where we're not involved. There are places that we will potentially be involved one day. So God, our hearts are burdened. We are concerned. So we pray that you protect the men and women serving this nation. And God, I pray for our leadership of this nation. From those who are in Congress to those in cabinet positions, to our president and vice president, to those who sit on judicial benches. Lord, we pray that those who are leading this nation would make decisions that would be pleasing to you. 
We know that there is an agenda in the media to distort the truth. And for that, we should not be surprised. For your word tells us that as we approach the end times, people will indeed become lovers of self, lovers of evil. And so God, help us as churches. The churches in this community, the churches, the evangelical Christian churches around the world. May we be the kind of salt and light that you have called us to be in this dark and decaying world. Lord, bring revival to this place. Bring a great awakening to this nation that our world would be forever changed. Lord, may we be ready when you call. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our hymn this morning is 387. Please stand and sing with us. Good morning. You know, I, I want to tell you, I am uh, somewhat glad that that this that we are living in is the age of the New Testament church rather than the Old Testament church. Now, we study the Old Testament and we still follow many of the things related to the Old Testament. But through Christ, we have a new covenant. Now, let me tell you what we might be experiencing today if we were in an Old Testament church. When you came to church, you were probably going to see a lot of blood. You would have been seeing some bulls to be killed. You would have been seeing some sheep, lambs to be killed. You would have been seeing some turtle doves to be killed. And I would probably say that for most of us in here, that would be kind of a scary scene. You know we don't do that anymore? You're right. But on a day like today, we are going to take of the Lord's Supper. 
for all who are Christians we will take of the Lord's Supper. And what we have are little pieces of bread here. And these little pieces of bread are to remind us of the flesh of Jesus Christ that was broken, the flesh of Jesus Christ that was torn. But then we also have this grape juice in here. And do you see the color of that grape juice? The color of that grape juice reminds us of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed. You see, what we know that God established in the very beginning when sin came into this world, God established a process for the forgiveness of sins through the shedding of blood. You see, we do not sacrifice animals in this church because Jesus Christ died on the cross and he is the final and the complete sacrifice. There's no more sacrifice that is needed. You see, week after week after week, the priest would bring sacrifices to be made because none of those sacrifices were ever good enough. They were simply a picture that pointed us to the fact that one day in God's timing, he sent his son Jesus Christ to shed his blood so that everyone, everyone could have their sins forgiven through that one sacrifice. And I know that it's kind of hard for us to understand. So very simply, I want you to understand this. The only way that our sins can be forgiven is through Jesus Christ. We must believe that Jesus is our Savior. Pray with me. Lord, I thank you for these children. And I know that it is difficult sometimes to fully understand. But God, I know that for many of these children, you are teaching them. And day by day, they're learning more. They're understanding more. And God, I pray that, that when that day comes, that your Holy Spirit directs them to you. God, I pray that they would be willing to say, Yes, Jesus, I believe that you are the one who died to forgive me of my sins. And Jesus, I surrender to live the rest of my life for you. So God, help us to understand. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You can go back to your seats.
We are going to close out this series of looking at how do we worship. Uh, Next week, we'll begin a new series that is focused on Jesus as the high priest. We're going to spend some time in the book of Hebrews as we lead up to Easter, as Jesus is indeed the great high priest. This morning, I want to begin the message by reading to you the prayer that Jesus prayed for His church. The prayer that Jesus prayed for His church, for all who would follow Him after His death, His resurrection, and His ascension. This prayer comes from John chapter 17, and I would invite you to turn there if you would like to. At least make note of it. John chapter 17 is the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ. What we see is a prayer that is prayed in reference to himself, a prayer that is prayed in reference to the disciples that were currently surrounding him at that time, those believers at that time. But then where we're going to pick up in this prayer, the prayer is now being focused towards you and I. In other words, you're going to get to hear a prayer that Jesus prayed for you close to 2,000 years ago. Isn't it an amazing thing that we get to see what Jesus prayed for us? And I think we have much to learn in this prayer. And then we're going to go from this prayer into our message as it is focused on worshiping the Lord through the ordinances. So look with me, beginning in verse 20 of John chapter 17. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me Through their word. So he begins this saying, I'm not praying just for the disciples that are here, but I'm praying for those who in the future will come to believe in me through their words that are being preached, that they may, listen, verse 21, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given to me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. What is the thrust of this prayer? What is the thrust of what Jesus is praying in this prayer? Jesus desired unity in the church. He desired unity in the church. You read the letters of Paul. You read the letters of Peter. You read the letters of John, of James. And you will see that throughout each of those, there was a desire for unity and specifically unity within the local body of believers. We're going to spend some time this morning focusing on what are two very important elements of worship that are worthy of us taking just a little bit of a deeper look at. These two elements are the ordinances of baptism, and of the Lord's Supper. Two things for which the New Testament prescribes for the church to practice. These are not rituals, but they are very symbolic acts of obedience that demonstrate our common and unified faith. This faith that is based solely on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And this morning's message will primarily be a teaching message of biblical doctrine. So if you would now turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 
And we'll read a few verses. And then I'm going to flip over to Ephesians 4 and read just a couple of more verses. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll begin reading in verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And Paul says this further in Ephesians 4.4, 4, For there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to be to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Pray with me. Father, this morning we thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to come together for worship. And God, I pray that this morning that you will teach us. God, I pray that we would not approach the Lord's Supper as just a ritual that we will partake of. Your word teaches us that as often as we do it, we do it in remembrance of you. It does not say as often as you do it, just do it for the sake of doing it. We are to remember you. We are to remember that our salvation, our hope, our faith rests solely in the work of Jesus Christ. And so, God, I pray this morning that you will teach us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's begin with one body, one body. The first part of this message is going to focus on the one body of Jesus Christ. We as a church, we are a body of believers because our hope, our faith, and our salvation rest in the one Jesus Christ alone. Our hope is not found in doing more good works than bad works. You can get that in a few religions But that is not where our hope lies. Our faith does not consist in good karma. You can find that in some, but that is not where our faith lies. Our faith lies in Jesus Christ. Our salvation is not in Joseph Smith or any other man. It is in the man, the God-man, Jesus Christ. You see, this is the gospel that's proclaimed in the New Testament in the fullness of time. In the fullness of time, at the right time, God sent of His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, who was with Him in the foundations of the earth, who is equal to Him. They are one, and I know that blows our minds sometimes to fully understand this, but He is bigger than we can even understand. But in the fullness of time, God sent His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to be born of the flesh in a very amazing and a miraculous way. The Virgin Mary gave birth to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ came to do the will of His Father. He lived His entire life as a sinless life, and He chose, He allowed Himself, He he was willing to, Go to that ultimate price of the death of his life through the crucifixion. And so Jesus willingly gave of himself. Jesus willingly became a blood sacrifice for you and me. You see, I am a sinner. And I hope that all of you in here understand that I'm not pointing fingers at you, but I'm simply telling you what the Bible clearly tells us, that we are all sinners. Every single person in here, we are sinners. And we need the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus Christ came to be a substitute for you. You see, my sins deserve death. That death is an eternal separation from God. That death is that when this mortal flesh 
kills over. When I die, I deserve to be forever separated from God. That is what I should receive at death. But I'm telling you, folks, I'm not receiving that at death. And it has nothing to do with me being a good preacher, a good person, or anything else like that. It has everything to do with what Jesus Christ did. You see, Jesus Christ was my substitute. Jesus Christ was the one who made that blood sacrifice so that when God Almighty the Father sees me, He does not see my sins, but He sees the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, that has forgiven me of all of my sins. His blood sacrifice. Listen, He did something I can't do. He did something that no bull, no sheep, no pigeon has ever done. He died and three days later he rose to life. There's resurrection. And what is being offered to me is an eternal resurrection. There's an eternal life that is being offered to me. There's an eternal life that is being offered to you. Not because you deserve it, because you don't. I don't deserve it. But it was offered to me and I came to that point of saying, I know that Jesus Christ died for me. I know that he rose to life on that third day, securing for me an opportunity of eternity in heaven. But I need you also to understand this about that one body, about that one Jesus Christ. That one Jesus Christ is going to return. And we'll speak of this a little bit further in the message, but John the Baptist said that Jesus comes and he baptizes with the Spirit and with fire. Do you understand that Jesus Christ will return to judge? He will judge in accordance with what is written in this word right here. And no one will have an excuse No one will have an excuse. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? It's very clear in Revelation chapter 20 that anyone whose name is not written in the Lamb's book of life will spend an eternity in the lake of fire where the demon and the false prophets have been cast. Where Satan himself has been cast. So how do you get your name written in the Lamb's book of life? You must believe. On Jesus Christ alone. Not on your works. When you come to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. When you come to that place that you surrender and say, Jesus, I know that you are the only one. I have to come to that point of repenting, of turning away. Turning away from that sinful life that I have lived. And begin to walk daily with him. Have you done that? Have you come to that place in your life that you have said, Jesus, you are the one and only. Thomas saying, Jesus, I don't know the way. And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, there is only one body that can be broken. There's only one body that the blood can be shed that we might have the forgiveness of sins. And by that one body, you and I are born again. And 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, and now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. You see, as we come together as believers, we come together In the one body of Christ. Do you know him today? You see when we come together to observe this Lord's Supper. It is a memorial of the death of the one body of Jesus Christ. It is not only a memorial of his body that was broken. His blood that was shed. But it is also a time in which you and I should be unified together. Understanding that he is going to come back. He is going to come back to judge. 
He's going to come back and he's going to separate out those who are true followers from those who are not true followers. For those who are not true followers, he's going to cast them into the lake of fire. And for you and I who are true followers of Jesus Christ, he will reward us richly in the kingdom of heaven. And we come to this time and we remember that his body was broken. But we come to this time that we also remember that there is a day coming in which the judge will bring judgment. Are we ready? You see, the problem is the church has not always been ready. If you would look back just one chapter to 1 Corinthians chapter 11... You'll see that the church was struggling some. What was the prayer that Jesus prayed for the church? What was the gist of that prayer? I I told you all, somebody, come on. Unity, that we would be one. Listen at how he describes the church of Corinth here. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Wouldn't that be harsh to hear? Church? I don't commend you. And listen to what he says. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating it, Each one goes ahead of his own meal. One goes hungry and another gets drunk. What do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat the bread and drink of the cup for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we We may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things. I will give directions when I come. Do you hear what Paul is saying here within the church? They were coming together to break bread and to remember the body that was broken, but they were not. Why were they not? We say, well, they were breaking bread and they were drinking the juice. So so why were they not actually taking the Lord's Supper? Because they were not one. There was selfishness. There was pride. There was bitterness. There was anger. Can you imagine what that person would feel like in their bitterness and anger towards somebody who just flaunted themselves? Can you imagine what kind of selfishness that must have been in that situation? And here's the reality. This morning, we have the great privilege through the Lord's Supper of remembering that it is only through Jesus Christ that we will be forgiven. So will you today examine your own hearts? And I pray that you have already. Will you examine your life? And will you today take of this as a body as a fellowship 
remembering that Jesus' body was broken, that Jesus' blood was shed so that you and I may be one with Him. With Him. That we may be one with one another. Men, would you come? As we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, I want to remind you once again that it is better for us to not partake of the Lord's Supper than to take of the Lord's Supper knowing that we have unrepentant hearts towards God. Knowing that we have unrepentant hearts towards another. You see, we come together at this table in forgiveness in the same way that we have been forgiven. Wilson, would you pray?
as we just read, Paul said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. We come together as a body, a body of believers, to remember the Lord's Supper. We also come together under one baptism, under one baptism. We share together that as followers of Christ, we have all received one baptism. The one baptism is by Christ through one spirit. If you look again at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, he says, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Paul is rather clear with us. And honestly, right here, he's not speaking of water baptism. He's speaking of that same baptism that John the Baptist spoke of in Luke chapter 3 when he said, the one who's coming, he baptizes with the Spirit and with fire. The Holy Spirit set forth an order for the church in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, what we see in somewhat of a history book type format, as Luke writes this, to provide for us documentation of that church within that first century. Listen at what Luke writes in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 36. He says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls To himself, and with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. I want you to understand that we, as we come together as a body of believers, we have one spirit, we have one baptism, and that baptism is when Jesus Christ forgave us of our sins and he gave to us the gift of the Holy Spirit. I do know that within certain other religious teachings, there are some religious teachings that say that you become a Christian and then later you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is not true. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, at that very moment that you surrender your life to Him, then what He does, exactly what Brenda was singing just a moment again, a moment ago, you have been made new, you have been given, you have been filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And what we see is that the model for the New Testament church as set forth here in Acts chapter 2 is that as the people repented, they baptized, they were baptized every Every one of them, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. They received the Holy Spirit not only in that generation, but as he says, the promise is also for all the generations to come, according to verse 39. Now let's talk about water baptism for just a moment. Do you remember Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch? You remember that Ethiopian is, is riding in this chariot and he's reading from the, from the gospel, from a scroll of Isaiah. And God, in a very powerful way, brings Philip into his path, brings him up alongside there. And as Philip comes up to speak to him, he says, you know, do you, basically this is what he says, do you understand what you're reading? And, and he basically says, you know, I'm struggling here. Can you help me? In beginning right there, 
in the God, in, in, I said it again, right there in Isaiah, he preaches the gospel to him. As Isaiah is writing about that lamb to be slaughtered, about that blood sacrifice, Philip says, it is Jesus. It is Jesus whose body was broken. It is Jesus whose blood was shed. It is Jesus who is that sacrifice. And that, that eunuch at that point, he believed. He believed and he says to Philip, Philip, there's some water over there. Let's go and let me be baptized. And Philip said, let's go. And they went and they got down into that water. That water did not save that eunuch. It is when he placed his faith in Jesus Christ that he was saved. But he knew that he needed to follow through with an act of obedience. In Matthew 28, in the Great Commission, we are told that we are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. How do you become a member of this church? You become a member of this church by uniting together with this church in one baptism. That one baptism is the forgiveness of our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. But it is also a uniting together in what we understand to be a biblical baptism. And for some of you this morning, as you go through and read the book of Acts, you might come to understand that you yourself needs to follow through with this biblical baptism. Have you come to that point of salvation through Jesus Christ alone? You know, there are some of you in here who maybe you have been baptized, maybe you have been dunked, maybe you've been dunked a number of times. But you've never been immersed and submerged into that water and brought back up after you believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you've never followed through with baptism, then I want to invite you this morning not to let pride get in your way, but to say, you know what? I know that as I read through the book of Acts, I know that as I read through the New Testament, that the believers of Jesus Christ, believed and then were baptized. And I want to join together with this church. I want to be one with this church, and I want to follow through with baptism. You say, preacher, do you have a problem against me being sprinkled? Do you have a problem against them pouring water over me? (laughs) Not necessarily. I understand the historical reasons but not the biblical reasons for it. I understand that there was the sprinkling of the blood in the Old Testament, and I understand some of that, but the pattern that we see that unites us as a New Testament church is immersion. It is immersion in which we are showing the significance of my death, but also of my resurrection. As Jesus went down into the Jordan River. As we see very clearly with the Ethiopian eunuch there in Acts chapter 8. There was a going down into the water. The word itself simply means to immerse, to plunge. And you and I as a church are united in the baptism. And I want to invite you this morning. If Jesus Christ, who died for you, has never become your Lord and your Savior, then will you receive Him today? Will you come and say, I need Jesus? I am a sinner. And I have nothing to truly offer him. But I know that he will make me new. And I want to join in with this church. I want to be one with this church. I want to grow in my knowledge of him. I want to follow through with biblical baptism. I want to grow in my walk with Jesus Christ. Is that something this morning that you need to do? 
Is that something this morning that God is calling you to, to salvation in Jesus Christ? Maybe this morning God is calling you to rededicate your life to Christ. Maybe you've gone through the motions of the Lord's Supper, but you've gone through it with a bitterness of heart. Or maybe you've gone through it as just a ritual. And maybe this morning God has just been pounding your heart saying I desire more than just a ritual I want you to worship me I want you to give thanks at this table for what I have done I want you to celebrate and anticipate that I am coming back I want the divisions in my church to cease And so as I come to this table, as I come to the baptistry, we come together as one body, not as many bodies. We are many members of that one body, but we are one body. Do you this morning need to come to a point? Maybe you recognize you have not followed through with biblical baptism. And you say I want to join this church. And I want to follow up with biblical baptism. You say well, Brent will you not accept me. If I haven't been baptized in this church. No. We'll accept you if you've been baptized in another church. As long as you follow through with biblical baptism. This morning. How do you need to respond? Pray with me. Father this morning we come. And we sing a song very familiar, just as I am. And that is the honest statement for every single one of us. God, we need to come to you just as we are. But God, we do not need to stay as we are. We invite you to do a new work. To do a new work in our lives. To forgive us of our sins. To cleanse us. To purify us. Lord, may we be a holy people who walk with you daily. Holy not because of our works, but because of your work on the cross. And so, God, this morning in this time of invitation, if there are those who need to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they need to receive you, they need to surrender themselves to you, then I pray that this morning they would do so. Father, I also pray this morning, maybe there are those who need to rededicate their lives to Christ. Maybe there are those who need to follow through with biblical baptism. Lord, maybe there are those who desire to join this church. God, may we be one body, the body of Christ that you have called us to be. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I want to ask you to stand. We're going to sing just as I am. How do you need to respond? I want to invite you to respond in obedience. Let's sing.
Fairy tale or something. Except this is like all true. Capish? <clears throat> Once upon a time, in a big loud city called New York. Hey, you mind? I'm reading a story here. 
Thank you. Now, where was I? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> in a city called New York, in a part of town called the Bronx, in a neighborhood called Mott Haven, people all of a sudden like started seeing this new guy all over town. Does it make sense uh, that a small town boy from Missouri uh, would end up in the South Bronx? But coming here to Mott Haven, I walked onto this block not knowing a single soul. Andrew. Andrew! Who he was was Andrew Mann, and what he was and is is a Southern Baptist missionary. A couple of years ago, Mott Haven became the neighborhood Andrew moved into to do something he calls Love Loud. In New York City, there's several neighborhoods that have struggles uh, where life is just sometimes tougher and, and sometimes harder. And it's in those neighborhoods where uh, we believe God can work in some pretty miraculous ways. Here's how Love Loud works in Mott Haven. Every day, Andrew's friends go and pick up kids when school lets out. Then they bring them back to what everybody calls Graffiti 2. That's the place Andrew opened up here, where families can come and learn about Jesus. I think often in neighborhoods like this, they don't see people that have loved them. They don't see people that have cared for them. But we believe that's our God-given mission. Every day at Graffiti 2, love first looks like math and spelling. Good job. All of us, like, we like graffiti, and these are the graffiti people, and the adults, right, they're here to help people with their homework. Six, twelve. 18. Very good. I might want to stay here forever. Disciples 500. After homework help, love looks a lot like a wise guy who's really a wise guy. Andrew, hmm, he's cool. He's a cool dude. He tells us like different things and yeah, he's cool. And finally, love looks like a Bible kinds of trees in this garden. And a missionary who explains it in a way that people here really get. It wasn't until I got to graffiti so that um, I experienced that joy in my heart. So first of all, remember there's a Sabbath day. That lady there, that's Mildred Marin. Her kids came to graffiti. Then they told her she could come to the church Andrew started. She did, and the rest, as they say, is history. It was on November 25th that Mildred was born again. I'm a God's follower. Call me whatever, but I'm a God's follower. Now Mildred helps out at Graffiti too. And now, just like that, bada boom, bada bing, she and her kids are part of a big, beautiful family. I, I call Graffiti too my home. <laughs> because no matter what happens, we always together. Like, he knows a lot of stuff, right, Andrew? You know all about God and Jesus, right? I'm learning all the time. And as for Andrew, well, you helped put him in Mod Haven with your gifts to the Annie Armstrong Easter offer. So now, he fits in. And because of that, this one big, beautiful family can live happily ever after. Now, when I walk these streets, this is my home. And graffiti, too, for me, is family. We're the family of God. All right, just a quick little promo reminding you this little uh, deal inside your bulletin. This is a prayer guide, and day one starts today. And so I want to encourage you to go through this week each day. Uh, read one of these little... Um, uh, articles and uh, pray for those missionaries there and then throughout this month we have an opportunity to give to our Annie Armstrong offering very similar to our Lottie Moon our Lottie Moon offering goes to international missionaries to pay their salaries to keep them on the field in the very same way the Annie Armstrong offering goes to pay their salaries to keep them on the field and so great opportunity for you to participate you say well who's somebody we know the Edwards you know the Edwards in Wyoming and they are North American Mission Board missionaries. The Turnbows that we've worked with with years are no longer with North American Mission Board, but as DOMs, he's still working 
uh, with the North American Mission Board, but we have had great opportunities with that. Several quick announcements, and then I'm going to ask Miss Jackie to come up here. Uh, children's ministry team meeting today at 4, uh, 3 o'clock uh, meeting with um, a discipleship advisory team. Next week, guess what? Daylight savings time. Bless all of our hearts, right? Isn't that a, isn't that a wonderful thing? Uh, but we're going to spring forward. And so uh, youth who are leaving out on your mission trip slash camping trip, um, make sure your clock gets set or else you miss the bus, all right? Uh, that is uh, upcoming. Russell, anything you need to say about that? Be here on time. All right, good job. Uh, Wednesday. Eight o'clock sharp, okay? Eight o'clock sharp. If you think you did not set your clock right, then show up at seven o'clock. Will that work? All right. Miss Jackie, come stand up here beside me. Miss Jackie emailed me at the first of the week and said, uh, Brother Brent, I just want you to know that I've rededicated my life to Christ. So I replied back to her and said, Miss Jackie, is that something you feel like you need to share with your church? And we talked about that just briefly. And she comes this morning to say to you that she has rededicated her life to Christ. And I want to ask you on her behalf to join alongside of her and to encourage her and to strengthen her as she has rededicated her life to Christ, wanting to follow him faithfully. Miss Vicki, as her Sunday school teacher, would you come up here and stand beside her? And I want you all to, to, um, to join in praying for Miss Jackie, and we are grateful. Come on over here and stand beside her. And we'll actually let y'all stand to the side of the table so there's room for people to come by. Y'all come by and hug their necks here in just a minute. Glenn, close us with prayer.